Welcome to another YouTube presentation by the London Transport Museum Friends. Our speaker this time is Mark Yexley. I first met Mark when he started his career in the bus industry with London Transport in 1979. It turned out to be a very distinguished career, taking Mark into the privatised world of London buses as Managing Director with Arriva London and latterly as Operations and Commercial Director for Arriva Bus as a whole. Mark retired in 2015 after 36 years in the bus industry. Retirement has given him more time to pursue the personal interests he has in various transport projects. It may not surprise you to hear that one of those is the restoration of a particular type of Routemaster bus. The other project may come as a bit more of a surprise, but I'll let Mark explain more about that in his talk. Before I hand over to Mark, here's my usual reminder. If you're watching during the premiere of the talk, you can post comments and questions to Mark using the chat function. If you're watching at a later date, then please leave your comments as we do welcome everyone's feedback. So Mark, what's been keeping you busy in retirement? And uh, thank you, Barry, for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to um, my session for the London Transport Museum Friends, which uh, we'll try and make as uh, interesting and, and lively as, uh, as possible. Um, so to start with, uh, the 2nd of July 2015 was quite a momentous day for me. Um, it happened to mark the end of 36 years of uh, working on the buses and uh, it was retirement in inverted commas, and I'll explain inverted commas in a minute, um, which um, had been very much of my um, choosing. Um, it was really driven by two things. One was the realisation that uh, uh, Arriva, who very, very happily worked for, for for some years, was about to go through some uh, fairly fundamental changes, and you just reached that point where... Um, you run out of enthusiasm for, uh, uh, for for living through that latest round of changes, really. Um, but the second reason was uh, being acutely aware that there was a growing list of things that I really wanted to try and do and be involved in, and uh, somehow work was always going to get in the way of that. And really, um, the session today will take you through two of those particular things, one you can see in the bottom left-hand corner is the world of heritage diesels, and particularly class 50s, and we'll talk about some of the history, and hopefully I can give you a bit of an insight into what's involved in keeping them um, on the rails, and indeed running on the main line in a couple of cases. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, you've got a picture of BEA2, which really picks up from... Um, bit of a teaser that Paul Sainthouse left in his wonderful presentation about his passion for route masters about a preservation project and I'll take you through that and bring you up to date with where we are with with things. So let's begin with a uh, slide which tries to encapsulate 36 years of very happy career on the buses and as you see here are the main highlights um, for me, there are two points I'd really like to make about all of this. One is that my career coincided with quite a tumultuous uh, series of changes affecting the bus industry. I started in 1979, so I was in time for the bus districts being set up. I coincided with um, tendering and with the Wayfarer 2 ticket machines uh, when I was at Finchley obviously was there throughout all of the privatisation process and had a bit of a, a bandstand view of that as operations planning manager. And then, of course, coincided with um, things like the congestion charging and uh, the amazing things that happened within London in the uh, uh, early 2000s. And then from an Arriva point of view, that was a fascinating uh, series of changes from uh, a group that had a load of uh, car dealerships and a very big leasing business and a small bit of buses represented by us um, to one where we became um, a very big player in Europe in 16 different countries with loads of buses, trains and the odd uh, ferry and a few taxis and, 
and ambulances thrown in for good measure. So it was a fascinating time, and um, I have absolutely good memories of uh, of the whole thing. Um, True, there are inevitably some difficult times, but you just work through those. Uh, But the abiding memory is uh, is a really good one. But the second point I wanted to make was that this really has been all about people. Um, It's a bit of a cliche to say that people are the ones who actually change things, but it's absolutely true. Um, So when I started in um, 1979, London Transport's corporate chin was on the floor because um, I can remember there being around about 1,200 unfit buses every day. So that's the equivalent of um, 10 garages the size of uh, wood green, just filled up with buses going nowhere. And obviously from that dismal beginning, there had to be a recovery. And I wondered where that was going to come from. And part of the answer actually started to appear the very next day that I was instructed to report to the principal executive assistant in the public relations office, who was one Mr. Lejeune. And actually, that was my first uh, encounter with uh, any important person in uh, London Transport. And uh, Barry gave me a very polished, um, very impressive run through both what the public relations office was about, which was much more than just being glorified complaints bureau, but also sort of setting the scene as to uh, the changes which would sweep in on the back of um, pushing authority down into the bus districts and uh, their Mr Buses. And sure enough, um, you started to meet up with some truly inspirational figures. I was eternally indebted to Frank Giles as the operations director for taking a personal interest in me. I was very fortunate to um, um, also benefit from the likes of Peter Hendy and Steve Clayton, who had blazed the trail as graduate trainees a few years in advance, um, offering a huge helping hand uh, throughout. And then you became more aware of um, other people like uh, Norman Cohen and Warwick Hillman, Ken Blacker, uh, Derek Keeler, Brian Gilbert, Graham Elliott and, and others who were really so instrumental in, in turn, turning things around. And a bit further down the food chain was was me and um, one of the other things that happened in 1983 was I came across uh, this uh, shy and retiring person called John Cately. Uh, we were all on a, a senior road inspectors course and um, it was one of those occasions when you, you just could feel the enthusiasm and the energy and the, the willingness of people to challenge what had gone before. So that was one people's story that uh, partly explains why the Red Bus setup managed to uh, pick itself off the floor. And then I had other great teams of people, uh, the London team, particularly when I was uh, MD, was uh, sensational and could move mountains. And likewise, uh, the team of very uh, young, talented, enthusiastic people that I had in uh, Arriva's UK bus setup uh, in the final six years of of my time, they were great fun to work with and um, uh, and they contributed a huge amount. However, all of that uh, came to an end, as I've explained, on the 2nd of July in 2015, when I retired in inverted commas. And... um, The next slide uh, really takes us on to why describing this as a retirement is a bit of a misnomer, because actually it's been chock full of um, uh, really interesting things to do. It started a few weeks after I left Arriva when the phone rang and that heralded a period of about two years worth of consultancy work, mainly working on rail bids and um, usually doing the bus rail integration side of those those bids, which for me was great because um, I think it's a hugely unexploited area to bring the local bus networks and plug them in more fully with the um, corresponding rail networks. And uh, just to give you one example of it, um, if you take uh, Bangor Station up in North Wales, um, there's been a long-running campaign to reopen the railway line to uh, Carnarvon. 
and yet uh, just outside the station, although you wouldn't obviously know it if you were inside the station, is um, uh, a bus service running every 15 minutes, begins at six in the morning, finishes after 11 at night, and that takes you right into the centre of Carnarvon. And why wouldn't you want to um, make more of that existing bus service and promote it more fully and offer people a seamless journey? I also carried on um, helping out uh, CPT, chairing their bus commission. Uh, That followed on from a really enjoyable year as uh, president in uh, 2012. Um, I also took on the uh, chairing of the UK Bus Awards, which is um, really providing a shop window for the industry to show off everything that's uh, good and great. And yet, uh, just outside the station, although you wouldn't obviously know it if you were inside the station, is um, uh, a bus service running every 15 minutes, begins at six in the morning, finishes after 11 at night, and that takes you right into the centre of Carnarvon. And why wouldn't you want to um, make more of that bus existing bus service and promote it more fully and offer people a seamless journey? I'll get off my soapbox now. And that's been enormously interesting to do, to try and make sure that we keep the awards um, uh, relevant and fresh and in step with all the changes sweeping through the industry. And then um, I also ended up on the board of uh, Lothian Buses in 2015, and that that continues on to this day. Um, You can see from the picture on the right, uh, the very high standards that are set within Lothian Buses, uh, in that you could probably eat your dinner off the floor of of that garage, uh, which happens to be um, Central Garage in uh, Annandale Street. And, of course... um, it's had the financial clout to do um, really interesting things like buying in those uh, triaxle double deckers that you can see in the picture as well. And then there have been other things uh, to accompany it. Um, joining the LT Museum as a patron has been great. That's opened all sorts of uh, enjoyable, interesting doors that um, we and uh, the friends of the muse- museum have uh, joyfully walked through over, over the years. And then um, we also uh, bought an arrow boat uh, to go with um, the replica of an AC Cobra that I've had for uh, a good few years now. So lots going on, but as I said at the outset, I really want to uh, concentrate on Hercules and Hood, which are the class 50s, and also on the BEA2 story. So let's move on to talk about class 50s and... uh, just to explain how all that started for me, which was in September 2015, when a very good old school friend, Phil Swallow, um, who's been heavily involved with the Seven Valley Railway and with um, these locomotives, invited me out to spend the day on the footplate. And it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Loved the experience. They let me get my hands dirty, quite literally, by doing all the coupling and uncoupling. So it meant jumping off the platform, scrabbling around uh, in a sea of uh, hoses and and, uh, coupling links. Uh, And and it was great. And at the end of it, I asked how I could do more. And uh, the answer was to put in a chunk of money into 50031 Hood. Hood at that time was a way um, in Derby being repainted into the intercity swallow livery that it actually never carried, but it could have done if um, things had gone a different way in uh, the the mid-80s. So taking a a shareholding in Hood was the answer. But just to give you a a quick history lesson on the Class 50s, it really started in 1960 when the British Transport Commission realised that it had over-ordered on the um, lower powered ranges of uh, diesel locos and desperately needed another batch of um, locos to um, allow it to withdraw the final slug of 400 odd steam locomotives. The specification they were looking for was a diesel capable of 100 miles per hour but also with mixed traffic abilities, so passenger and, and freight. 
and English Electric were suitably um, inspired to um, put forward their own prototype, which was uh, number DP2, which uh, entered service in 1962. DP2 had a Deltix uh, body shell, but it also had a, the next version of the 16-cylinder a power unit that they'd used in the class 40s in a variant of it being used in the um, class 37s which were um, all in service by then but it didn't really go in English electrics way and um, for a long time it looked as if brush were in the driving seat with their class 47 but then English electric uh, played their cards really right and DP2 actually showed that it was was pretty reliable at a time when the Class 47s were running into all sorts of, um, of uh, engineering problems. And furthermore, English Electric offered the opportunity to British Rail to lease the locos, which allowed them to sidestep the um, controls of the uh, Treasury. And they also signed up to an arrangement whereby they guaranteed on pain of uh, financial penalties that 42 of the um, eventual class of 5050s uh, that went into service would be available at all times. Well, they were built in 67, 68, and very quickly ran into all sorts of um, uh, reliability problems. Some of them were um, self-induced. Uh, there was a uh, manufacturing problem which uh, caused fractures to occur in the in the power units themselves. Others were um, endemic and um, the class has always had a, a problem with um, uh, what are called flashovers in the uh, in the generators. Now, a flashover is, is, is really caused when you have a, a huge amount of electricity with nowhere to go such as can occur on these locos if you shut the power off suddenly at speed, you suddenly end up with a whole uh, wad of electricity at high voltage and it's got nowhere to go. So it will, it will look for the weakest point and it will flash over within the generator. And the flash over is strong enough to um, cause arcing, which will melt metal and can also cause severe damage to the, the generator itself. So between that and the fact that these locos were being used very intensively on the Anglo-Scottish services and in fact were used uh, throughout the night on the sleeper services to places like Inverness and, and so on, meant that um, two things happened. Uh, one was that the backlog of maintenance crew built up, which um, had the silver lining of letting English Electric off the hook of um, the availability regime but what it did do is it, it gave the locos a, a, a terrible reputation for unreliability even though they were actually really popular with the drivers because they were a draft-free cab from the locos rode well and they had markedly faster acceleration than a, than a class 47 but things moved on and they were run run in pairs on the um crew Glasgow trains uh, prior to the electrification and then after the electrification kicked in they got moved on to the western region and the decision was taken to put them through a refurbishment program which actually took off a lot of the new features which had also contributed to the, um, uh, the chronic unreliability in their early days. So off came the um, uh, air filtration system, which gave them their nickname of the Hoovers. Off came the um, the wheel slide uh, protection. Off came the um, uh, slow speed creep control, and off came the uh, rear static braking. And uh, with that, and also the fact that the depots on the western region had got more used to them, they they entered a period of relative calm before being. Um, uh, displaced on uh, away from the intercity services out of Paddington onto the uh, Waterloo Exeters and the uh, Thames Chiltern services. 
And then there was a sort of crucial point in the um, mid 80s where the intercity sector had to really choose between whether they held on to the 50s or, as in fact happened, whether they opted to uh, just concentrate on the class 47s and uh, gradually push the, uh, the 50s in, into, the, uh, into the exit room. So uh, the first one got withdrawn in 1987 and they'd pretty well all gone by 1992. But three of them were used for uh, uh, rail tours, the last of which happened in 1994. But that was not the end of the story because, um, because in fact, a remarkable 18 of the 50 have, have ended up in uh, preservation. And the ones that I've got particular interest in, um, three of them uh, were all bought for preservation in 1991. Hood it was that moved to the Seven Valley in 1992, but Artwell and Exeter had spent time down near, near Hastings, and when they'd been fully restored, they also moved up to the Seven Valley in 1996. And then, um, hand in hand with that, there was another group involved in Project Defiance, and uh, that moved to the uh, Seven Valley Railway in 1999, and the two groups combined resources to form what has uh, continued be, to be known as the Class 50 Alliance, and um, that has worked really well in, in looking after the, uh, the four locos. So further highlights uh, in the preservation world were um, return to the main line, which uh, Hood spearheaded in 1997. Um, at that time, it took full advantage of the liberalising of things in the wake of uh, the, the rail network being uh, privatised. So suddenly, um, things were not beholden to um, the corporate decisions of British Rail, but pretty well anyone who had a, a loco that could uh, pass through some reliability scrutineering could use the loco on the main line. And in that period, you saw, you know, a fantastic variety of locos uh, taking taking back to the main line at the head of charter trains and, and all that, that sort of thing. But then that started to come not to an end, but to become more difficult in the wake of the um, tragedies at South Hall and uh, Ladbroke Grove, which meant that um, a whole load of kit had to be fitted to locos if you were to use it on the main line. And uh, if any, for anyone who works in the bus industry who uh, thinks that we've got lots of um, al alphabets, uh, initials to uh, act as shorthand for things, I can assure you that the rail industry beats us into a cocked hat. So um, looking at all those uh, letters there, um, the train protection warning system, uh, the follow-on from AWS was one thing you had to have fitted to your loco, along with a radio telephone along with a black box recorder and unlike buses where um, things like that can be done relatively cheaply you're looking at a sort of £50,000 bill to, to do those three on a loco and, and of course that started to dramatically restrict the number of locos that, that ended up on the main line. So another issue around uh, preservation was where, where you maintain, where, where you do the heavy maintenance. Um, I, I mentioned that um, the uh, 50s spent their early days down at St. Leonard's in the company of a whole load of uh, buses, which were in various stages, stages of being uh, restored as, as well. Well, actually searching for somewhere where um, you could do, do the heavy maintenance and, and restoration on these was a major challenge. So we were lucky that we had Old Oak Common, but then when that uh, started to shrink as Crossrail development started to take place, uh, they moved on to uh, Cardiff Canton, but then that again uh, got closed off to us when um, Colas, who had the space, uh, started to need it to um, uh, provide for their expansion. Um, so really between um, 2012 and 2016, in the case, case of the uh, Seven Valley Class 50s, we just had to make do with an open air pit, which was just about big enough to take one of the bogies. 
and not much more. And um, it's enormously difficult to do the um, to do the heavy work when you are uh, so dependent on the elements. But as you will hear in a minute, um, salvation came in the uh, construction of the uh, train maintenance depot at uh, Kidderminster, which is a, a three road shed um, with all the facilities. And that has made an enormous difference in terms of the preservation story. But let's move back to... Um, OK, so turning back to uh, the Hood story then, here it is having uh, returned from Derby after the repaint into the uh, Intercity Swallow livery. It's worth explaining that uh, it never carried that livery uh, for real, uh, but it could have done. And um, although the purists will say that this is sacrilege putting a locomotive into a livery it never, never carried, from our point of view, um, it's actually a really useful, important way of generating interest. And, and, and certainly the, the loco looks absolutely fantastic in, in that livery, the more so when it's got a string of um, intercity carriages uh, in, in tow in, in the same colours. So the shareholding duly got, got handed over and I think the important thing to explain is um, that Hood had already been bought in 1991 by two uh, shareholders in the um, 50 fund, um, which became part of that Class 50 alliance with the uh, the guys from uh, Defiance. So Hood had had two owners but the 50 fund had acted as the custodians for the loco. What that means is that the 50 fund has uh, taken on board all of the um, uh, funding of the, the, the maintenance costs of the loco. So as a shareholder, you're not sitting there waiting for the um, email to pop through, giving you the grim tidings that something's gone um, seriously wrong and is going to cost thousands to, uh, to fix. And that was quite an important consideration from, from my point of view. But it didn't stop there because uh, the opportunities to uh, put in big slabs of money continued unabated. And um, we were offered Hercules in 2016. And the attraction was that unlike Hood, Hercules still had all the gear fitted to it to run on the main line and indeed its uh, previous owner had been doing just that with a collection of other locos that he rents out for um, uh, for all, all manner of purposes. So huge interest to be able to acquire a loco in main line condition and it also fitted very neatly with a wider ambition which was for us to be able to get the locos back out on the main line. Defiance was also uh, fitted with all the gear, uh, but we really needed another 50 to make it uh, a possibility. And here was um, Hercules being presented to us. And the, the attraction was that we could then go to um, the uh, people behind the companies offering uh, train charters with the proposition of uh, two mainline locos capable of 100 miles per hour 10 miles per hour more than anything else on offer, which might not sound a lot, but for those of you who've worked in the world of schedules, you'll know that even odd minutes are as crucial in the railway world as they are in, in the bus world. And with a pair of them, you're actually offering um, 5,400 horsepower as a, com as a combined effort, which means that you can um, uh, take the heaviest of trains over all the gradients on, on the system and obviously for a, a train charter operator being able to run 12 or 13 coach trains makes a world of difference in terms of the um, uh, of the margins you can make by, by filling up those extra those extra carriages. So um, Hercules came on board we rapidly realized that uh, uh, the generator had suffered from those same uh, over problems that I alluded to earlier. So pretty early doors, we had to um, t 
take the generator out and to do that you have to lift out the whole power unit which is a 28 ton lump but that was removed uh, generator was refurbished and we took the opportunity to completely clean out and repaint the insides of the the loco um, so it really looked the bee's knees when it uh, actually ventured, ventured back into use. The other thing to talk about with this particular loco was it had a, a starring role in the celebration of the Great Western Railway's 150th anniversary back in 1984. And uh, a bit controversially, it was rena renamed Sir Edward Elgar and repainted in um, GWR Brunswick Green fully lined out with brass number plates and, and the works. So um, it's, it's had a, another look to it entirely, which whether we um, resurrect that at any point or not, who knows, we, we, we will see. So let me quickly introduce you to the other th uh, three locos. Exeter on the left there has been uh, res restored back to its uh, 1967 condition with the head code box uh, there. Uh, and then on the right, you can see uh, Defiance peeping out behind uh, Art Royal. Uh, Defiance has got a snowplow fitted. It was also um, an unusual loco because there was a tryout of um, adapting the locos to heavy freight operation, which involved uh, re gearing uh, Defiance. Um, it really didn't work very well, so um, it got converted back to being a conventional Class 50 in, in 1989. But there's a bit of a history behind the loco too. And then uh, on top of the four, which became five with, um, with Hercules, we've fairly recently also taken on board uh, Glorious. Now, Glorious was one of the uh, final three Class 50s in service along with uh, Hercules and uh, Fearless was the, the other one. Had a bit of a checkered history after it stopped doing the, the work in, in 1994. Was originally going to uh, end up in the National Collection at York, but that didn't really quite come off. And then really since 2004, um, it had been left out in the open and although the engine had been started from time to time, it really hasn't done anything for um, uh, for literally uh, the last, uh, last two decades. However, the owners of the loco, Tysley Loco Works, um, approached us and there was an agreement that we would take the, the loco into Kidderminster, fully restore it, and then uh, be able to run it for, um, um, for at least a three-year period after that had happened. And uh, so the loco came in in May. It was in a truly shocking condition externally, but we managed to get it uh, up and running for the um, for the special anniversary gala of 50 years of Class 50s in, in October that year. And uh, since then, there's been a sort of uh, gradual um, working through of the loco to bring everything up to scratch uh, mechanically. And as you can see from the picture, it's, it's also had a sort of full um, and comprehensive uh, repaint. And, and that in turn has uh, spawned um, uh, some more work coming in from uh, Tysley in the shape of uh, one of their Class 47s, which um, has been in for, um, uh, for a full repaint and uh, will feature at the, uh, uh, the Diesel Gala um, fairly shortly. So let's switch the attention back to me and my um, uh, life with the Class 50s, which um, um, apart from the working parties, I was really keen to get on the footplate. And the first rung on the ladder of that is to uh, become um, a shunter. And uh, you can see the, um, the, the, the sort of maids of all work that we use to, to, do, the, to do the shunting, including on the right-hand side, the uh, Class 11, which actually has its... Um, uh, is, is actually a, an old uh, LMS pre-war design. Uh, it's a fascinating thing. So I ended up eventually passing out uh, as, as a shunter. I won't bore you with all the uh, gruesome details of working in um, storm, flood, hail, tempest, uh, and all the rest of it. But uh, if you like the outdoor life, if you like the physical side of it, 
and you don't mind getting a bit muddy and wet and oily in the process, then uh, then shunting is the, is the world for you. The three things that, that keep you most uh, concentrating on the job of hand is, um, first of all, you discover there are a, an enormous number of uh, rules and regulations and processes that you have to get your head around. And the logic behind that is it's all designed so that even if you have people who don't have radios, don't have mobile phones, everyone knows what everyone else is is going to be doing and doing it in a safe manner. Um, so it's enormously important that you don't, uh, you don't try and cut corners with, with that. The second thing which came as uh, a bit of a surprise was um, that the... Uh, the actual shunt is entirely your responsibility because usually you're the only person who can see where the the front of what you're shunting is in relation to people and, and objects. So basically nothing happens unless you say so and certainly nothing stops unless you say so at the right moment. So the responsibility is actually significant. And the third thing is that to add to that uh, awareness of the responsibility uh, the whole of the yard at Kidderminster is on a one in 160 gradient so if you ignore uh, the need to securely stable locos uh, they will actually run down that gradient at a rate of knots and uh, that is obviously to be avoided at, at all costs. Um, this is the south yard and what you can see in front of you is the uh, carriage shed. That carriage shed can hold 58 uh, carriages and um, uh, the interesting part if, is if you look straight ahead you can see a sort of double slip and um, what is often the case is that there's a whole load of shunting going on in, in and out of the carriage sheds at the same time that, that things are being moved around um, within the loco yard. Um, so it is absolutely crucial that you um, tie up uh, properly and coordinate properly with um, whoever's involved in the shunting uh, in and out of the carriage sheds. And to add to the fun, you can see in the background there the two running lines um, into uh, Kidderminster. So things can get quite busy, uh, particularly on the uh, on, on a summer, summer Saturday. Um, and then on the left-hand side, you can see uh, uh, top left is the exit from the, um, from the yard out onto the running lines. And you can see the very impressive looking uh, signal gantry uh, controlling that. That actually comes from, uh, came from Taunton originally. Uh, and then bottom left-hand corner is a view looking, standing from the edge of the carriage sheds looking back up towards the uh, the TMD, the train maintenance depot, a couple of class 50s, the class 14 teddy bear, which that's a uh, yellow loco, loco, and the nose of the class 40 in, in the background. And then on the other side of the TMD is uh, the north yard, which is really dominated by the, um, the turntable. Uh, this uh, originally came from Fort William it might seem a surprising feature in a diesel depot, but actually it comes in really useful in turning the locos round to um, to just even out the, the wear on the, the wheel sets. And also, um, when we're out on the main line running in multiple, we um, couple the two locos with the uh, the radiator ends in the middle which just means that if the uh, the driver has to get into the uh, engine room area, uh, they're not having to shimmy past uh, a bank of very hot radiators to, to, to do it. So that's that's the turntable, and of course it gives access to the um, uh, the other end of the um, of the TMD as as well, as you can see on the right there. But trying to bring you more into um, what are the, the crucial things that need to go on behind the scenes to make um, uh, to keep uh, class fifties alive and kicking? Well, maintenance facilities is one crucial, crucial one. And the big difference that the TMD has made is that we can just do so much more really, really quickly. So on the left, you can see the ten-ton crane, which can just uh, move along inside the depot. 
pulling things out through the roof hatches. In the middle, uh, we have a full-length inspection pit with side pits, which, which again is is vital for being able to do things like brake block changes uh, uh, relatively quickly. You've got um, two per two per wheel, so that's uh, twenty four per per loco times two. So changing forty eight brake blocks in a rush it would be impossible without those side pits. And then on the right, you've got the um, the thirty five ton uh, lifting jacks, which means you can get the body off the uh, bogies quickly. So if anything needs doing with the traction motors. Uh, again, they can be rolled out uh, and, that, and that can be done quickly. And frankly, without those facilities, I, I don't think, I think we would have uh, struggled with the amount of work that we're now doing um, out, on, out on the main line. Another facet of the, uh, of, the, of the Alliance and the 50 Fund is, of course, the people side of things. That starts with everyone who um, makes any donation, how big or small of whom at the last count there were just over 900. That breaks down to uh, about 25 people um, who will normally populate the working parties. And uh, crucially, within that, we've got enough people who are real experts in the mechanical side, in the uh, electrical side of things, in training drivers, raising money, and the operational side to to make the whole thing function, and you can see um, the guys in the um, orange uh, garb are the uh, the riders on uh, one of the um, one one of the tours. Uh, we provide them just to ride shotgun and to provide assistance, and of course it's absolutely brilliant experience for for those guys to uh, to ride on the the footplate. Another side of this is raising money, and this won't come as any surprises to anyone. The point to make here really is that the sales activity has uh, has seen the turnover increase fivefold, and that's by dint of uh, offering some really attractive uh, uh, things for people to uh, spend their money on. For example, the nameplates you see um, there. In just uh, one weekend, we 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 sold uh, thirty six of them. They, they look absolutely brilliant on the on the wall of a of a sitting room. But the other aspect to it is having a, a good online sales facility, and um, uh, so put what you're selling with making it really easy for people to get at um, has has made a huge difference and, and brings in a really useful lump of money. So. As we've previously mentioned, there's always been this ambition to get back out onto the main line and to uh, take part in rail tours. And we managed to achieve that with um, Defiance and Hercules. And here you see photos from uh, two of the, uh, the tours which have been undertaken in the last uh, couple of years or so. The one on the left was the Caledonian, which uh, ran from uh, Crewe to Glasgow, uh, recreating uh, the days of the 50s working in, in multiple on the Anglo-Scottish trains. And it was uh, done in the 50th year of the Class 50s, in 2017. Um, it also was run in conjunction with the Railway magazine, celebrating 120 years of them publishing and also with Rail Express, their, their sister magazine. And then another anniversary which was marked was uh, 25 years um, after the last uh, Terminator tour ran in 1994. So in 2019, we repeated the same Terminator tour, badged it as the Terminator Phoenix, and uh, uh, ran the same route in reverse. So it started in Paddington, went down to Penzance, and then came back to, to Waterloo. And uh, you can see the, uh, the shots of the locos, Newton Abbott on the way down, and at Penzance went, waiting to come back again. So the rail tours, uh, from the commercial point of view, are tremendously important. The way it works is that we get a flat fee for providing the locos. So someone else is uh, paying for the 
drivers, someone else is paying for the fuel, and someone else is taking on board all the commercial risk of um, selling seats on the train and sorting out the fun and games of uh, finding paths for for the special working and, and all that type of thing. So obviously we know that our reputation gets shredded if we have any failures out on on the main line. But the huge plus in all of this is it's a very useful chunk of money. If you do uh, two or three rail tours in a year, then it's a very useful shot in the arm into the uh, 50 fund finances. And you'll have seen on that previous uh, photo um, the two locos have now appeared in uh, GB rail freight livery and really it's time to talk quickly about the um, the connection that we've got with uh, GB rail freight. The GB rail freight uh, connection started with them providing drivers for the rail tours. We trained up a pool of their drivers for the idiosyncrasies of the, the class 50s and uh, once they had the pool of drivers it was probably only a matter of time that interest would stretch beyond just doing rail tours and in fact GB Rail Freight came to us and said look would you be interested in um, us using uh, the locos on a spot hire basis i.e. can be quite a short notice need they pay for the loco when they use it but not at other times and from our point of view there's obviously another big win that it's yet more revenue coming into the coffers of the 50 fund that has given them a bit more uh, flexibility in being able to um, uh, take on board more work do the short notice uh, uh, work as well uh, and and use our locos uh, to to do that Uh, and so uh, they've literally been all over the place and I mentioned that the uh, snowplow attached to uh, defiance would uh, come into its own Um, I don't think it was actually under the GB rail freight banner but um, defiance and hercules were being used to do route learning around Derby just before the uh, station got dug up and uh, that coincided with the beast from the east and the only show in town that had a snow plough attached to it uh, was Defiance so for two nights it was actually used to uh, run up and down the um, middle and main line between Derby and I think it got as far as south as Loughborough keeping the tracks clear of snow, which was uh, a brilliant return to service of of defiance in in that respect. And then uh, closer to home, there's been no end of work uh, to do with uh, uh, shuffling um, surplus HST trailers, uh, ironically enough, taking them to uh, um, the scrapyard in uh, in Newport and also uh, taking power cars and trailers which have ended up on various preserved railways as well. So um, that's all been very good news for us. And it got even better when um, GBRF approached us and said, would you be prepared to um, see the locos painted into our livery and we'll pay for it, which took um, probably one nanosecond to say, uh, yes, that sounds a brilliant idea. Thank you very much. And you see some of the pictures are from the unveiling of the locos at at Eastleigh um, after that had been done. Um, and then the further manifestation of this uh, this relationship has been um, GBRF coming up to the Seven Valley Railway and using it for um, corporate days so they can entertain their, their customers, show off the latest in uh, new wagons and um, give them a fantastic day out. And, uh, and all of that has been part of a, a really good relationship. But it's obviously not the only relationship we have because there's a crucially important one with the Seven Valley Railway. Here's just a little snippet um, for you to look at of um, a 16-mile, really a pretty line, lovely recreation of a typical GWR branch line. You see the Panier tank is representative of some of the steam locos on the line. It's got a very fascinating collection of uh, of old... Uh, carriages as, as well as uh, more, more, more modern stuff and uh, the whole thing has just been restored to a, a very very high standard 
So if there was one thing that I had to pick out to explain why I think the Seven Valley Railway is a bit special, it is its ability to recreate the past. When the railway eventually reopened to Kidderminster in 1984, uh, the main line station in Kidderminster was completely inadequate for um, playing host to um, a whole load of uh, trains off the Seven Valley itself. A brand new station had to be created next door using the old goods yard. So it was necessary to recreate an entire station. And what was done was uh, to completely replicate Ross on Y station as the frontage of the new Kidderminster, which you see on the left, with all the uh, sort of typical Great Western Railway features uh, attached to it. And then the same thing had to be done with the uh, signal box, which didn't exist. Uh, that signal box is a copy of, uh, of a standard GWR design. Um, it's actually got 62 levers in it because um, Kidderminster itself is quite a busy place. Not only do you have the two running lines, you've also got the carriage sheds and the loco yards that you've been introduced to and the exit from that. But behind the box is the access to the uh, the old goods shed, which is used by the uh, the guys restoring um, carriages. Um, and furthermore, there's a connection with um, the national network um, through an exchange road, which um, uh, runs on to a set of points getting out onto uh, Kidderminster and all points be beyond. So one of the labours of love was actually to uh, recreate the um, interlocking of all of those levers with the points and the signals uh, attached around uh, Kidderminster, which in itself was a, a phenomenal achievement. But let's move on to uh, uh, just round up with uh, what does the future hold for the Class 50s. There are a few immediate engineering issues. Uh, one is that the uh, wheel sets on two of the locomotives uh, are wearing out and uh, you can't just uh, get them off the shelf or um, find them in the scrapyard. So they've got to be reforged, which um, is in hand as we speak. The other thing is that we're doing what we can to, um, to improve the locomotives themselves. Bear in mind that in BR days, they uh, hardly ever got cold. Uh, was obviously in preservation there many times when you're having to start them up from stone cold, which is uh, uh, is not great for the locomotives. So fitting things like preheaters is part of a program of works um, to, uh, to to upgrade things. We've also got an ambition to get Exeter back out on the main line, and that would give us a, a spare loco to to play with to uh, to underpin the other two. I can't see us being in the uh, market realistically for acquiring any more Class 50s other than um, in helping out other groups with uh, restoration work. Bitters has happened with Tysley Loco Works and a bit has happened recently with uh, helping two of the other groups to um, um, get power units and uh, generators removed from uh, from their restoration projects. And then beyond that, um, it's all a bit in the hands of um, things happening in the wider piece. Obviously, the um, pandemic has really hit the fortunes of uh, the Seven Valley and other preserved railways hard. It hasn't exactly done wonders for um, uh, the funds of the uh, Class 50 fund either. So we need to work our way through that and also be aware that emissions controls and the um, switch of uh, the main line railway over to um, digital signalling systems is also all round the corner. But these are all challenges and uh, certainly for the people who've been involved from those very early days of 1991, so much has been overcome. So having taken you through the Class 50 story, let's move on to talk about buses and specifically bring you up to date with the uh, BEA2 group. Paul, in his fabulous presentation about his passion for route masters put in this teaser of a photo on the the left that showed the back of um, BEA2 and a cast a cast of villains who you'll some of whom you'll you'll recognize so you've got Leon Paul myself 
uh, Bill and Richard. And um, what follows is really the story of where we've got to with um, restoring BEA2 back to its uh, former glory. Um, so as far as BEA2 is concerned, it was one of the batch of 65, uh, which was uh, originally uh, built in the 1960s for the BEA services uh, from the West London Air Terminal out to Heathrow, which it, uh, it, it was duly part of. In 1976, they were acquired in stages by um, LT. Uh, crucially, BEA2 wasn't in the first batch of 13, which were uh, some of which were quite extensively altered to become trainers. Um, but in fact, it was the 14th bus to uh, join uh, the LT stock. And as such, as you'll see later, it, it means that it preserved pretty well all of its original features, which was uh, quite an attraction to us. And really, it spent all of its time as a staff bus at Aldenham. And uh, uh, we've got some fascinating fo footage of the sort of Le Mans style getaway out of Aldenham Gates uh, uh, with it and a, a horde of other RMAs belting off uh, back down after uh, another hard day's work in the, uh, uh, at, at the plant. Uh, but then in 1987, it was sold for preservation. It ended up with Green Rover, in whose livery you can, you can see it here. Uh, and then really, for the last 30 years, it hasn't done very much. In August 13, it was uh, bought by Rob Duker. And um, that was where we came across it and subsequently bought it in um, August uh, 2019. So why... Uh, the coming together of the BEA2 group. Well, for me, it was a brilliant opportunity to um, to do something jointly with the, with four great friends. And then there was the added attraction uh, that these uh, route masters were actually geared for uh, 60 mile per hour running, and that had an attraction to to me. And also, it's it's part of uh, a really interesting um, operation. Uh, and uh, others have written the, the, the detail up of that, of um, of how actually of how actually BEA ran the services from the West London Air Terminal, indeed the terminal points that had preceded it, and how the whole thing worked. And I must admit, I was a bit sceptical about why you needed sixty-five of these things to run the service, but they did actually need every one of those buses on some of the um, peak weekends uh, uh, at, at the height of it. So um, we, we all came together, um, if I talk you through the beginnings of this, um, in 2016. And uh, I went with Paul to have a first look at the bus in 2017. Then everything went quiet for a while. There were one or two distractions. We'd bought the, uh, the narrow boat. Um, I was getting more stuck into uh, the Class 50s. So things went a bit quiet until um, 2019. But we, we ended up buying it. It was towed to Milton Keynes. And then shortly after that, it moved over to the most brilliant of bus restorers in the shape of uh, Dave Simmons. Went up to Plaxton's near Sheffield in uh, 2020, uh, December. And, uh, and we got the bus back in, um, in March. So here's some shots in August 2019 to show you uh, the condition it was in. Uh, Rob had actually uh, started on some of the restoration work, as you can see from the, the panels, and, and very helpfully reinstalled installed the uh, the BEA light boxes. Uh, the picture on the left is of the uh, towing truck narrowly dodging someone's uh, car uh, while it was on its way to Milton Keynes, and the other three are of uh, the bus in, in Rob's yard. So Obviously, the first task was to get stuck into the um, the big stuff the, on the body and mechanical side. On the left, you can see the uh, the radiator, uh, which was um, Stuart, who works for Paul's finest hour, because he um, straightened out all of the radiator fins that you can see in the bottom left-hand corner to create the uh, 
immaculate looking radiator that you see in the top left hand corner. Um, coming towards the middle, uh, you can see the back of the bus with the towing bracket reinstated. Below that, you can see the um, amazing um, cat's cradle of, uh, of the wiring set up that was present on the bus. Moving over towards the right, you can see the, uh, the floor has been grubbed up and below that, the um, seat cushions have all been retrimmed. And then on the far right hand side, restoring the doors and getting them to work properly was another major triumph for, uh, for Stuart and took hours of work. And then the, there's the mechanical work uh, to attend to, which you can see a sample of in the bottom right hand corner. But then um, uh, between uh, various lockdowns and uh, Imba not happening in uh, 2020, the mission started to creep. And we all contributed to it. Paul, as you may remember from his presentation, uh, had this tendency to take the view, well, if we're going to do, do something, then we might as well do something else as well. And then my contribution was uh, hankering after the larger 11-litre engine that uh, BA buses were, were fitted with. And, of course, there's no point in doing the engine if you don't find um, the special high-speed diff that the um, BEA buses were fitted with. Leon hankered after finding a trailer, and uh, and we all actually signed up to this idea that we were going to try and get the bus back to its, its original condition. So here are some of the manifestations of that. Um, the buses were all fitted with, with, with Basto heaters. Um, we managed, well, Paul managed to find one of those, which you see in the top left-hand corner. Um, you see the towing bracket and the dustbin lids for the, the wheels, polishing up the uh, hub covers, finding the right route master badge to go on the radiator grill. And then uh, coming back to what I said earlier, the bus had a lot of its original features. It still had the, um, uh, the courtesy curtain, which I doubt has ever seen a washing machine uh, since it got put in in the 1960s. And um, you can also just about see uh, that the night blind uh, is still in position over the uh, front saloon window too. So that helped us along. We found the um, uh, AV690 engine in Switzerland. There was an advert in the uh, uh, that wonderful publication uh, by the Routemaster Owners Association. So we uh, set about uh, buying that and shipping it back to, um, uh, to the UK. Then the hunt for the trailer was, uh, was just amazing and took us to a scrapyard, which actually had three of them, which had sat there since uh, they were withdrawn in 1972. And as you can see from the picture on the left, um, trees had actually grown up through them and uh, here's Matt, who's another of Paul, Paul's guys, uh, hacking away at the trees. You can just about see the um, upturned uh, axle of one of the um, of one of the trailers peeping up out from all the undergrowth. So we um, hoiked them back to um, uh, to Milton Keynes, and uh, the next uh, slide will show you a bit of a before and after on the trailer chassis. And uh, Stuart and Matt have done a most amazing job in restoring uh, uh, what was badly corroded into something which is now eminently serviceable. It's worth saying that the um, advantage of having three trailers was that um, these are festooned with um, unique bits and pieces like the, um, the jacks and like the um, special hydraulic mechanism for raising, lowering the, uh, the jockey wheel at the, at the, at the front. And, and we've managed to um, salvage enough of those unique bits to um, make the full restoration a, a possibility. And we've since moved on to uh, start putting the, uh, the, the framework onto the, uh, onto the chassis. And then, of course, another part of the fun has been um, actually assembling all the um, 101 bits and pieces you, you can find. Posted inside the bus uh, is this, this green notice, which basically says that the London Transport Executive uh, doesn't promise to do anything by way of either delivering you on time or in one piece uh, to where you want to go. 
and even and it will be even more of a miracle if your uh, luggage accompanies you at the same time and in one piece as well. So we 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 we're absolutely going to leave that there. Um, you've got the uh, the old record card for RMA fourteen when it transferred into LT ownership. There are various bits and pieces, the BEA um, accounts, uh, so sort of highlighting the uh, launch of the of the new buses, and of course no. Um, Bus Group would be complete complete without its high vi and then um, Leon tracked down a, a book of um, BEA matches, and we've even found an old uh, tax disc as well for uh, for the bus too. So let's uh, conclude with um, some uh, before and after photos to show you uh, where we, where we we had got to with the bus on its return from um, painting. Um, obviously, the trim's got to go back on the, the radiator, um, but you can see the transformation which has occurred in the intervening months. Um, so here's the rear of the bus, and you can see the, the towing bracket and uh, and everything else that has been, been restored. And here is uh, 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 the sideways uh, view showing the doors, the, the mirrors, the elephant's ears and um, just to conclude let's uh, just look at what uh, is going to be happening next well there are various other things we need to go to complete the look of the exterior of the bus there's still quite a lot of work to be done with the um, with the interior and then um, probably falling into next year is completing the trailer and uh, refitting the um, the 11 litre engine and, and the high and the high speed diff, but the um, the important thing is we've already had enormous enjoyment out of um, out of the project, and there's loads more to come, and we're very keen to uh, share it with as many people as as possible. So that really brings us to the end of this uh, canter through uh, what I've been up to uh, in my so called retirement, and uh, I'd like to thank you for. Uh, if you've uh, stayed with it uh, uh, this far. Plug for the LT Museum friends, do join them, and a uh, wonderful organisation to, to support. If you would like to um, see any more on the uh, Southern Valley front, there's a whole range of uh, brilliant YouTube videos. There's a really good one on um, uh, called uh, Kidderminster Diesel Depot Uncovered which will amplify some of the things I've said. And uh, finally, um, a big thank you to um, various friends who've uh, helped me out with the, the photos and um, my sincere apologies to um, two, which we, we just couldn't track down the, um, the, the owners for, uh, but we, we've used them um, in, the, in the presentation. And uh, that's it. And uh, thank you from me. Thank you, Mark. That's a fascinating and very varied set of projects that you've taken on. Uh, and no doubt they're keeping you nicely busy in retirement. I'm sure we all wish you continued success in keeping the Class 50 locomotives running. Uh, and we look forward to seeing the fully restored Routemaster bus on the road again, complete with its baggage trailer. Before I sign off, can I say to anyone watching this presentation who's not already a member of the Friends, please do think about joining us. Friends membership is a great way of supporting the museum and connecting with London's transport heritage. I should also acknowledge that if all goes to plan, between the time of recording this and the time you'll be watching it, the museum at Covent Garden should be open again. That's really great news. Booking arrangements can be found on the museum website, along with other museum forthcoming events at Covent Garden, Acton Depot and online. So thanks again to Mark for an excellent talk. Thanks to everyone for watching. Please join us again soon for another of our at home presentations.